And welcome to episode number 174 of the weekly Google Cloud Platform podcast. I'm Aja Hammerly, and I'm here with my colleague, Mark Mandel. Hey, Mark. Hey, Aja. How you doing? I'm pretty good, actually. Excited about this week's episode. Yeah, I've been up since 5 a.m. Eastern. And now I'm in San Francisco, so I don't know what day it is. But it's great. <laughs> I am so sorry, Mark, but I'm glad that you're out in the community <laughs> teaching folks awesome stuff about Agones. I, I do stuff. It's cool. So uh, this week, we have some pretty cool people coming to hang out with us. We have Ann Wallace, Security Practice Lead, and Michael Woolman, TPM of Cloud Migrations, both from the Professional Services Organization, or PSO. So they're going to talk to us all about what the PSO team does here at Google Cloud and how they help out customers. And later, we've got a question of the week about Cloud Build. But first, let's do the cool thing of the week. We have many cool things. What have you got, Aja? One of our coworkers, Amy Unruh, built an app that uses Cloud Vision to identify key features of images that are texted to it. The link is going to be in the show notes. And if you have lots of pictures of cats or pretty plants, it will tell you all about them and its confidence and it's identifying them. It's a really cool example of how you can hook up some of our ML APIs to your existing applications. Nice. So as many people know, I really love games. So this isn't specifically cloud, but it was so awesome. I just thought I'd mention it on the Google blog called Want to Change the Game? Design Your Own with Google Play. So the Change the Game program came out of Google Play last year, teamed up with Girls Make Games. They're looking for teens that want to share their game idea and vision of the future of gaming, basically for a chance to see their game come to life on Google Play. The grand prize winner of the challenge will win $15,000 towards a college scholarship and $15,000 for their school or community center's technology program, which is really awesome. Awesome. There's a whole bunch of other stuff in there as well. Unfortunately, it is US residents only, but if you want to get involved or you know a team that might want to get involved, I will have a link in the show notes to apply. That sounds awesome. My other cool thing for this week is if you saw the developer keynote at Next, either in person or you watched one of the recordings or the live stream, the Game of Life app that was demoed during that keynote is still up if you want to play with it. And it's at gameoflife.dev. Oh, fun. Yeah, uh, it's really cool. I didn't ever think of Game of Life as a team sport. I always thought of it as a fun mathematical exercise, but it's actually a lot of fun when there's five teams playing, trying to uh, outglider each other. So if folks want to check it out, it's still up there. Feel free to go try it and compete against your coworkers. Fantastic. Last but not least, again, I seem to be picking semi non-cloud stuff. This is a Google search thing, but it was just too adorable to pass up. I'm going to read the first paragraph because it's fantastic. Um, it's not quite cat a day, and we're a few months away from the dog days of summer, but searches for pets never pause. Around the world, people constantly ask Google questions about their furry friends, so there's no time like the present for a good old-fashioned, oh my god, look at that little face off. Um, so it's basically an article talking about how people search for about dogs and cats, and not only is an article discussing it, they made a website called whydocatsanddogs.com talking about all the trends that people ask about why do dogs do certain things or why do cats do certain things, such as licking or eating or uh, moving around or shakes or just weird sounds that they make. My dog makes a lot of weird sounds. So it's a lot of fun, whether you're a cat person or a dog person. I'm super excited about that because we all know you're a dog person, but I am definitely a cat person and I'm sitting here yep. recording being supervised by one of my cats. <laughs> and my dog is fast asleep next to me snoring. Dogs are so much better behaved. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Why don't we go have a chat with Anne and Michael though and get the interview going? So this week, I am very excited to have two wonderful people come and join us. We have Anne Wallace, Security Practice Lead, and Michael Warman, TPM of Cloud Migrations, joining us from the Professional Services Department for Google Cloud. How are you both doing today? I'm good. I'm doing great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us and coming to talk to us all about professional services and what it does. Before we do that, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourselves and what you do here at Google? Sure. My name is Ann Wallace. I'm based in the Portland office. I am currently the Global Security Practice Lead for Google PSO or Professional Services. The security practice is fairly new. We uh, spun off of the infrastructure practice about six months ago, so I've been helping build that out within the Americas and globally. Prior to Google, I spent 14 years at a 
major athletic company in Portland. I had a lot of roles in architecture and engineering. And when I'm not working, you can find me running very long distances on trails and in the mountains. You run like ridiculously long distances. Yeah. 50 K is 50 miles. My dog has run up to 30 miles with me. (laughs) My dog barely runs. <laughs> I, like if we hit a hill, she's like, nah, it's hard. No. <laughs> yeah, I have a German short hair pointer. They are very energetic dogs. Michael, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I run double ultra marathons because <laughs> I have a rambunctious three year old, long, curly, blonde hair who we call the dude. So I'm constantly chasing after him. Occasionally, I'll chase after mountain lions in the Berkeley Hills. For professional services, I'm an infrastructure practice lead. And, you know, infrastructure is kind of the catch-all practice, compute, storage, networking, containers, app dev, security. But we're beginning to spin off these, like, sub-practices, and that's where kind of Anne came in and picked up security. So outside of that, I do big, gnarly migrations from on-prem to cloud, from other clouds to other clouds, and, yeah, I'm cloudy. Yeah, and actually, you know, Michael and I met it's probably six years ago outside of Google. The company I was working for, he helped us do our first cloud migration. So then we just ended up at Google together. Yes, and I remember debugging a custom Perl configuration management system. <laughs> it was amazing. Yes, yeah, so luckily we don't have to do that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so y'all said that you uh, work for PSO. What does PSO do? I mean, we help customers migrate applications and storage around. We help them, in essence, move generally from on-prem to cloud, right? That's like our charter. You know, more recently, it's been moving customers from clouds to other clouds and setting up kind of these hybrid environments. And you can imagine the challenges with this. I mean, I think customers that are kind of maybe sitting in the San Francisco Bay Area that are more tech-heavy have an easier job, but, you know, we have to service all customers. Therefore, you know, we can fly out to the Midwest and service some customers there. And, you know, it's different challenges. So, yeah, I think in a nutshell, that's what we do. But I think there's a little bit more to that as well. We work a lot. You can think of us as post-sale versus the pre-sales where you have our customer engineers and solution architects, but we also partner very heavily with those teams and work on solutions around security, data migration, AI, ML sort of things. And we're also getting a lot of customers who are wanting to figure out how to move their VM applications to containers. So it's not just the traditional lift and shift kind of scenarios anymore. Also, I speak at several conferences a year. We're at Google Next, uh, the cloud summits, and we work pretty closely with a lot of the PMs. I work very closely with a lot of the security PMs. We have a lot of input into the roadmaps for a lot of the services, uh, GCP services, just because of uh, customer input. To add to that, like everything kind of starts with the customer, right? So the professional service org is like the one that touches the customer the most. Like, we're there, we're friends with the customer. Like, I have dinner with the customer, and then I help them design their next generation products. So what does a a typical engagement with a customer actually look like? Where do they go? Like, how does it get started? And then, like, where does it go from there? It starts with a a scoping, right? It starts with a dream. (laughs) You know? Specifically at GCP, it starts with the dream of, like, I want to operate like Google. Okay. Right? And it just starts there. And then you kind of work backwards. And, like, what does that mean? It means, like, you know, being flexible, fast deployments, you know, able to iterate very quickly, being secure. So, like, it starts there, and then we kind of work backwards and figure out, like, how do we actually make it a reality? And so... It's challenging, right? Because, I mean, customers are running more monolithic applications, right? So they're older and, you know, now they want to run in containers and microservices and how to get the data up there, et cetera, et cetera. But I wouldn't say there's really a typical type of engagement because every customer is so unique and brings different challenges to us. And it's not always technical. Sometimes it's more organizational that we have to navigate through. But, you know, sometimes the conversations start with us. Sometimes they start before us, again, working with maybe a solution architecture team or customer engineers, and then we get pulled in when they want a little bit more than those teams can provide. And it might just start with a conversation, you know, maybe you're at a conference and meet up with somebody and say, hey, well, yeah, we have these sort of things. I still feel like it's pretty organic how a lot of these engagements start. Also with the packages, I mean, like, Anne, I think you're 100% correct. Like, 
we're constantly trying to generate reusable content, right? Like these reusable packages. But like, we found it hard in the sense of that every customer is unique. It's amazing. Like, they're using different flavors of code and different flavors of OSs and different networks. So and I've been in cloud a long time, and there are like pat common patterns. But it's amazing how many different combinations you see. And when you're doing an engagement, what sort of hands-on engagement are you having there? I mean, are you sitting down and building out architecture diagrams? Or are you sitting next to your engineers and writing code? Or Yeah, I think it's a little bit of everything. And sometimes the engagements are short. So with security, we have just a security workshop. So we'll go into a customer for around three days and do a lot of security deep dives into our services, a lot of best practices, kind of tutorials, whiteboarding. Then we have customers who want more of the come in, tell us how to move this from the data center VMs to containers in GCP. And that might be coming up with a technical design document. So it's writing out a lot of use cases and diagramming that. But then there also might be that case where it's like, hey, this is great. You've diagrammed all this for us and delivered this technical design document. But we really need help implementing that. So then we might have another engagement where we do that. We also leverage partners to help with some of this work. So if there's a lot of hands on keyboard or they want more staff hog, we tend to, instead of having Googlers set a company months on end, we use partners to do that. Yeah, I would say absolutely. I mean, Google has never traditionally been a consulting company. Like you don't think of Google as a consulting company. So we're definitely partner heavy, but we do try to mimic some of the success Google has had internally at our larger projects. So for example, we have a TPM that maps to a TL that maps to partner engineers, and we try to Can run... Can you explain those acronyms just for those who aren't Googlers? Oh, sure. Uh, <laughs> technical Program Manager, TL, is the technical lead. That's how we develop our products internally. And so we've had a lot of success mimicking that model at some of our larger customers. And then we're able to iterate faster, everything is documented, and we're you know status reporting well. And another added kind of layer of complexity that we see is that we're not just GCP, right? We're G Suite, we're Chrome, we're Android. So like that adds just another layer of, I wouldn't say complexity, but you know, when they go all in on Google, it's like they get access to all these different things. And it's kind of interesting how you can really transform a business, not just from a technical stack, but like from a people's and process. So that's something new that we've been working on as well. So you guys are on the front lines. You're hanging out with customers. You're learning things. You're helping folks. Any trends or changes that you're seeing that you find particularly interesting? One of the trends we're seeing a lot is multi-cloud. So you have customers who have been in AWS or Azure for a while, but then they see things that we're doing that maybe the other cloud providers aren't doing. We're just doing it differently. So we're seeing customers coming to us for GKE. We see customers coming to us for all our ML technologies, but then maybe they continue to use the other cloud providers for other things. And I also, I think really in the last year, it's been a big uptick in GKE or Kubernetes. A lot of companies now, it's like, if we're moving to the cloud, we just want to move to containers. We don't want to deal with VMs anymore. Again, I can concur, like being an old school BSD person, (laughs) you know, and as an infrastructure lead, I mean, infrastructure historically is compute network storage, right? And now, you know, they're beginning to abstract all that away into this like open source cloud. I mean, that's what ORS gets on, says we're the open source cloud, and therefore we're moving away from VMs and and this type of thing, and we're going to containers, GKE, Istio, service meshes. And so the long-term vision, I believe, of GCP is to be the open source cloud. You can run your compute here, you can move it on-prem, you can move data around. So there's a lot more, I guess, a momentum to that direction. Direction. I mean, companies want to get there because they kind of don't want to be tied to a cloud provider, right? They want their freedom. And the, I believe GCP is moving that direction, right? We're trying to just like open it up. If you want to use GCP, great. You want to run it on-prem, go right ahead. That's great. Are you seeing any particular GCP products that are like super hot right now? CSP. And I wish I knew what the acronym meant. Cloud services platform, that's what it is. This is it. And, uh, you know, ironically, you know, Eric Brewer, an old professor of mine, is kind of leading the charge here. It's just the open source cloud. It's containers, Istio, and now we're extending it out in that you can extend kind of like the Kubernetes language that's in YAML, deployment language, and now you can extend it out to further GCP services. So now I can start defining pub subtopics and cloud SQL databases, all within this Kubernetes. 
Kubernetes construct. So I'm super excited to see that happen. And yeah. And you seeing anything in particular with your customers? I think what I'm seeing, it's not so much hot services because I've been talking to customers who are really wanting security first. I think the trend is really to get the security teams at the table to, from the beginning. I think a year ago, even six months ago, we'd have customers who plan all these deployments were like we're ready to go to reduction. And then all of a sudden they get a big red flag. They're like, no, because the security teams weren't brought in from the beginning. So I'm really seeing a passion from customers about getting the security folks to the table first and coming from a security background, I'm very happy to see this. And just making security part of the deployment pipeline, baking security in from the beginning so they don't have to think about it later on. Absolutely. I would say one more thing I'm seeing a lot is very large data migrations. And I'm not talking about, you know, 10 terabytes or even 10 petabytes. I'm talking 100 plus petabytes. And so the new challenges for the infrastructure team is, how do I even move this data around, right? I know there are some products that you come in and plug a fiber in and you're supposed to you know, close your eyes and pray that all the data gets copied, but it's just much more than that, right? Because you're applying security policies to the data, you're encrypting it, and this amount of data, I think I did an analogy in a presentation saying, we're moving so much data at some of our customers, if you were to stack the hard drives up, it'd be higher than like three Golden Gate bridges or something. Like It's massive amounts of data, and I think this is fairly new that I haven't experienced to date. Why are they doing that? Servers go end of life, right? I mean, they're running these gigantic Hadoop clusters, NetApp filers. I mean, they just go end of life. And then now they're faced with, how do I make use of this data? Like, I need to obviously run MapReduce or, or parallel process it. And so I think it's a combination of end of life and the new frontier of AI. Like, they want to tap into Google's AI for the data. And the only way to do that, obviously, is to have the data in cloud. But again, it's like totally new challenges. I mean, you don't just R-sync or FTP the data up, you know, so. Given that you work so much with customers, you mentioned previously that you work a lot with product managers as well. Is that sort of shaping product and providing feedback? What does that internal stuff look like? Yeah, so there is a lot of that. So I work closely with a lot of the security PMs, so Andy Chang, CJ Johnson, Maya. So it is giving feedback. I've also been contributing to some of the PCI work and compliance work we're doing. And we also do sessions at Next, the cloud summits. We lead internal what we call SME academies. So it's leveling up a lot of the folks that are in the field. So PSO, the customer engineer, solution architects on security. So we do this a couple times a year, bring a lot of the security PMs and other folks to talk about roadmaps, what's going on in the field. So we're all kind of on the, the same page. And I've been helping build out some demos for the products that we have. So again, that's partnering with Andy a lot. So yeah, there's a lot of exciting things going on, but I, I really love the fact that we're able to feed back into the products and give input into what's being built. I would say I have a love-hate relationship with product managers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let me explain. I mean, we mostly love each other. But um, back to this, you know, when you're migrating 200 petabytes to a storage platform, there's a lot of things to consider. And so what we do is, like, as a TPM, I'm basically negotiating between product management and the customer, right? And it's this constant on you negotiation. And, like, we drive product. Like, for example, the dual bucket GCS feature that I believe now is in beta came from a customer saying, okay, I'm going to have, you know, my 100 petabytes in US East 1. And if I have a regional outage and I have a security event, I need to go through this data. Like, what am I supposed to do? So there's this new dual region bucket that came out of that requirement. Another example is the customer said, okay, I want to process this 100 petabytes in like 20 minutes, right? And you do the math and it's like, you know, I need 20 terabits a second of, of, of throughput. It's like completely outrageous. So, you know, I was able to like work with the security team and the customer to kind of like back that down to something like reasonable. So that's where the love hate. I mean, they love me when I'm negotiating with the customer and basically saving the platform, but they hate me when I'm demanding new features, right? But this is ongoing. I mean, any big customer, it's exciting, right? Product managers always want to partner with the PSO people. 
Yeah, but those features sound amazing. And it's so cool that they're driven by real use cases that we're running into that and solving problems for people that are on our platform. That's awesome. Absolutely. I mean, like, if you were to tell me I could have, like, petabytes and petabytes of data asynchronously copied to two locations at the same time, like, I don't know how they do it. Well, I do know how they do it, but... We have, we have big pipes. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty amazing. Very big pipes and lots of magic. <laughs> Our PMs, they are super busy. They are always very eager to speak to customers and present to customers. I'm, I'm in awe sometimes how they get everything done that they do. Just to add on, I mean, the platform is changing so rapidly that literally my full-time job should just be like monitoring new beta features. I tried to set up an RSS feed, but that didn't really work. You know, like I'm trying to figure out like a good way to digest all this information. So if any users out there have a good method of doing this, I, I'm all I hear ears. the podcast is really good for that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But then I'd be listening to podcasts like, you know, like 24 hours a day. Well, if you ran 30 you miles, go. you could listen to podcasts. So we've heard about some of the cool and challenging problems you've run into. Any others you want to share with us? Because I know everyone loves hearing about all the other cool problems that other people have. I'll even speak for Anne on this one. Like you're oh, getting, oh you're, no, <laughs> yeah, you're getting ready to roll to production. Like you're ready to click the button and just say go, and then the CISO walks in and says like, "What's going on?" Right, and you're like, "Oh, I'm migrating like all our infrastructure to cloud." And then he puts a kibosh on the whole thing because, like, obviously it hasn't gone through the proper, like, security reviews and audits and compliance. And I mean, yeah, that's a true story. And that's a true story over and over again. But I think now that we have the security practice and some of our, our sales teams and our technical account managers know that they're trying to get security at the table to begin with. And so we have unblocked a couple of these scenarios just by having security folks in the room. And regardless of the security folks were part of the infrastructure team two months ago, but because they have that security title, it's helped. And again, it's just trying to automate security into the workflow to begin with and having it almost seamless. And so you don't have to think about it. Actually, yeah, you say automating security. Are there any particular tools or products that you really liked for doing that kind of stuff? What I like right now, and I always end up saying this incorrectly, but for containers is using Grafeus and Cretus for signing, using that with binary authorization. So you can set policies to check for multiple different things, but you know, for different vulnerabilities, vulnerability scores, if they're high or medium or so forth. And if those are found, then the Cretus doesn't sign the container image. And if you go and try to deploy it, it gets stopped. So I think that's a pretty neat tool that we have out there right now. So binary authorization is in GCP and Grafeus and Cretus. And again, I'm sorry if I said that incorrectly. We'll put links in the show notes. We'll work it out. <laughs> Our open source projects that we have. You have your technical issues. And I think Probably more importantly, you have your people issues. And like, it's generally the people issues that kind of like provide like the roadblock, right? And so in larger migrations, you're like navigating emotions, you know? Like, I'm almost a psychiatrist at these projects, right? Like, I'm coaching them about like their cloud migration and coaching them about like how to retrain their org. And it's a lot of pressure, right? You have to retrain people. Maybe some people might lose their jobs as a result of some of the migration. So, there's a lot of people aspects to our job. I've got a challenging one. They've got an architecture diagram from Miles Ward. Miles Ward hands them something beautiful. It's amazing. It's AI. It's automated. It's DR. Like, you know, half the world could get hit by a meteor and this thing would still run. You know, it's like they get handed this and they're like, yes, I want it. Then you go in there and they're running like Windows 95, right? So that can be challenging. They know what they want. They want the big picture and the, the beautiful Googliness. And then, you know, it's, it's just kind of hard to get them there. And so reality can be tough sometimes, but we're there to iterate them and like kind of help them out, right? So first of all, hi, Miles. Second of all, how do you step people through that? Like, how do you, how do you take someone from, from somewhere where they're in a, a less modern architecture and, and bring them up to speed in what may be cloud native or whatever the, the buzzword is right now? We're working on a, a partner package, well, a package that basically takes them the first step to containers. So you can run a container orchestration system like Kubernetes, right? And it orchestrates you know, multiple containers and load balances and does all that fun stuff. But you can also run a container in a one-to-one -one mapping to an actual VM. So, like, I'm working on a package that says, okay, I'm going to take your VM, I'm going to 
containerize it, which gets you, then you can use the tools that Anne mentioned to kind of do the security and get it in a registrar. And then you're going to deploy these containers on a one-to-one -one mapping to GCE. So now you're containerized, but you're still kind of running on a lift and ship mode. So that's like an initial step. And then security comes in and you get all the features, uh, you know, like GLB, for, for example, offers, uh, I believe it has like DDoS and other things like that. And Actually, I have something that's a little interesting. I don't know if it's an interesting problem that we've solved, but I think it's something different that PSO does and maybe other cloud professional services organizations. And it just slipped my mind because I've been so focused on security. But when I started at Google, I was helping build out CRE offerings with PSO. So I think you've had some of the CRE folks on the podcast before. And so CRE, just for folks who might not have heard that, is customer liability engineer. So they are some of our site reliability engineers who are customer facing and work with some of our larger customers on building out SRE practices within their orgs. So the CRE team is small and just overbooked. So they were looking to see how they could grow this. So they've partnered with PSO. So we're starting to offer CRE offerings. So some of this is just going in and doing kind of basic SRE 101, but then we also have SLO, SLI workshops. So this is, you know, taking a customer's application and running through what it might look like to set error budgets and your SLOs and SLIs. So the little bit I got to work on that six or so months ago was really exciting, but it's starting to kick off now. So there's a few folks within PSO who are driving that. So I'm, I'm really excited to see where that, that goes. Just to follow up there, I, I can't believe I forgot the SRE portion of all this. You know, I partnered with Liz Fong Jones, one of my favorite people on earth. Yeah. It's actually like a new construct. So I came from another large cloud vendor and we'd lift and shift and we'd lift and transform, but we never talked about operations, right? And so again, this is coming with the whole, I want to run like Google. So you can lift and shift a monolith and actually apply, you know, SRE principles to these monolith applications. So we're doing that as well. So we're trying to kind of embed this during the transition. You know, it's just a whole lot of fun. You know, when you start talking about error budgets and, you know, how many nines, you know, you know, the customer asks for five nines, but the application they have is two nines. It's like it, 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 it opens up for some interesting conversations. So if people want to get involved with all this awesome work you're doing in PSO, where do they go? They visit us at Google Next. <laughs> or I believe, like, you know, they talk to their GCP counterparts, the CE org, the sales team, the technical account managers, like, you know, we're all tied together, like one Google, right? So, you know, we're like a large hash map. Cloud.google.com, I think you can find us on there. We have tons of job openings. I think if you just look for cloud consultant, it'll come up with things in infrastructure, app dev, security, ML. So it sounds like if uh, people want to get in contact with you, best ways through their account rep or their sales contact? If they want to get in contact with PSO, yeah. I can tell you how to personally get in contact with me, but, you know. Yeah, you can send me an email, but, like, I'm, you know, have thousands and thousands of emails unread at this point. <laughs> well, we are running out of time, unfortunately. Is there anything you both want to mention? Are you doing anything special for Next or something that you want to make sure people know about? Anything along those kind of lines before we finish up today? Yeah, I will be it next. I'm not speaking this year. I'm just going to be hanging out, talking about security. Right after next, on the, April 13th, is a Women Who Code Connect Summit. So I'll be speaking there. That is also in San Francisco. And the KubeCon EU speakers just got announced. So I'm going to be speaking with Maya. And we are going to be speaking about container forensics when your cluster becomes a cluster. That sounds cool. Ooh. Can I go? Where is it? Barcelona. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I will be attending that. Well, thank you so much to you both for joining us here on the podcast. We really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having us. Bye. Thanks so much to Anne and Michael coming to hang out with us. It's always really interesting to hear about teams internal to Google, how they help customers and how they help support them. So super happy to have them on. Yeah, that was a great chance to talk and learn about something that I didn't actually know much about yet. But now it is time for question of the week. <laughs> Uh, and our question this week has to do with cloud build. And the question is, how do you cache files between builds in cloud build, which is something that a lot of folks want to do to speed up their builds and or because they've got interesting pipelines that they're trying to build where they have lots of different dependencies. So Mark, what is the answer to this question? I had exactly this problem. Basically, I had a file-based cache uh, that I wanted to store some records in and just persist it between builds to make things a bit faster. 
And I was like, okay, clearly I have Google Cloud Storage. I can push stuff up and down, but like, what if it's not there? What if it is? I don't want to write all this code. So I went hunting through the repository, which is the Cloud Builders Community repository under Google Cloud Platform, which has a bunch of Google Cloud Builder steps. Uh, these are custom build steps that you can use yourself inside Cloud Build that do some kind of fancy things. And there's a whole bunch of them. I'm not going to go through them all, but one of them that stands out and one that I really like is there is a cache build step or a cache, depending on whether you're Australian or American. Um, and what it has, it has a save cache and a restore cache functionality. So it will take basically any path that you like and chuck it in Google Cloud Storage. You can have keys. You can have your own keys if you want. You can tell what bucket you want to put into. It'll even do checksumming of a particular file. So if you want the cache to be stored with the checksum of a file and you want it to change when the file change, it's all kind of baked in and just works. So if you're looking for that, we'll put a link in the show notes, but it's super handy. Just put it in. It just worked. It was great. Yeah. And that whole community, uh, all those community supplied builders are really great because oftentimes the problems we have are problems someone else has already solved and we're really grateful to the community for the ones that they've contributed so even if caching isn't your problem you should totally go check out community builders repository on github and see what other folks have built awesome well before we wrap up Aja, what are you doing where are you going doing anything cool i'm not doing anything cool i am taking a break from travel and events to focus on family and my career and a bunch of other you know really boring stuff awesome good for you so i'm gonna be online if people want to see what i'm up to they can totally check out my blog at thagamizer.com or they can follow me on twitter i am the underscore thagamizer and for those who don't know thagamizer is the spiky part at the end of a stegosaurus i've got blog posts that are written and going to be released in the next couple weeks on doing coding assessments and interviews yes what we can do instead of whiteboards because there's been a bunch of tweets recently about whiteboards being awful and then i'm getting i have a horrible project idea that i'm going to use with ruby and gcp and and cloud storage and probably some of the ML APIs that I hope to have a blog post about in the next couple of weeks that folks can check out, especially all of my Ruby friends. And a new version of Ruby was just released uh, at Ruby Kayagi, and I'm going to check out pattern matching has been added as a potential oh. feature, and I'm going to check that out because I love me some pattern matching. So Fancy. if you're curious about my thoughts on any of those things, follow me online. Fancy. How about you, Mark? Where are you going to be going? What are you going to be up to? Yeah, so in... What, two, three weeks, I will be at Google I.O. I'll be doing the presentation there about open match and Agones working together, games on top of Kubernetes and open source, unsurprisingly. I'll mention something that's a little bit further in the future as well. In August, there is an open source and gaming day. So people may be familiar with the Open Source North America Summit under the Linux Foundation. We've been working with them and some other people looking to advocate for more open source in the games industry. So we're going to have a day. It's August 20th. It's co-located with the event. So it's going to be the day before. So if you are interested in attending, we'll have details in the show notes. But if you have any particular open source stories around anything pretty much to do with gaming, there is a call for papers open as well till May 4th. I believe that date's correct. I uh, will also have the link in the show notes as well. So that'll be fun. That's coming up in August. That sounds awesome. Cool. Well, Aja, I think that wraps things up. Yeah. So thank you all for listening. We'll have another awesome episode for you next week. See you all next week. 